This morning, the New York Times is reporting that Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito was flying the American flag upside down at his residence. And folks, as you know, the when you fly the American flag upside down before January 6th, it was a, a sign of distress. After January 6th, it became sort of a, a calling card, if you will, of the Stop the Steal movement. Those folks who who believe that the election was stolen. So it, it's an amazing development here, folks. And here's what Morning Joe said about it this morning. And a sitting Supreme Court justice has a flag flying upside down at his home that is a symbol of solidarity, as John said, with the Stop the Steal movement. We should explain a little bit here. The New York Times is reporting that a photo of an American flag outside the home of Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito has now been made public. The flag flown upside down. As the Times notes, the inverted flag has become a symbol of Trump supporters who claim, again, without evidence, that the 2020 election was stolen. Reading from the piece now, quote, the upside down flag was aloft on January 17th, 2021, the images showed. President Donald J. Trump's supporters, including some brandishing the same symbol, had rioted at the Capitol a little over a week before. Mr. Biden's inauguration was three days away. Alarmed neighbors snapped photographs, some of which were recently obtained by the New York Times. While the flag was up, the court was still contending with whether to hear a 2020 election case, with Justice Alito on the losing end of that decision. In coming weeks, the justices will rule on two climactic cases involving the storming of the Capitol on January 6, including whether Mr. Trump has immunity for his actions. Their decisions will shape how accountable he can be held for trying to overturn the last presidential election and his chances for re-election in the upcoming one. I had no involvement whatsoever in the flying of the flag, Justice Alito said in an emailed (laughs) statement to the Times. It was briefly placed by Mrs. Alito in response to the neighbor's use of objectionable and personally insulting language on yard signs, Joe. Wait, wait, so wait, 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 wait. So you're, you're going to hate on America because of something a neighbor did? You know, just blame the wife, right? And, I mean, that's that's pretty low of Samuel Alito to do. But folks, I've got to show you this too. So he's an extremist and Lincoln warned us against this. Take a look at this. Lincoln once said that the people will have ceased to be their own rulers. He said this as he was being sworn into office at the outset of the Civil War in 1861. Abraham Lincoln warned of the danger that an overreaching Supreme Court posed to the nation. And this is who Samuel Alito is, folks. So this is coming to us from Slate Magazine and his majority uh, opinion draft was actually leaked and they went on to say in this that they he actually said this folks if i can read this to you he said that um, he allowed for the possibility that legislators might punish people who don't get an abortion but exercise basic freedoms such as drinking coffee during pregnancy in a way that might be harmful to prenatal life at all stages of development Now, I've done some Googling, and it it seems to be the consensus that 200 milligrams of coffee, which I think comes to about a 12-ounce cup, is okay for people to consume, for ladies to consume that are pregnant. So, I mean, what, what kind of an extremist do we have here, folks? I mean, with Samuel Alito, I mean, it's, uh, it's just amazing, the, the politics of the Supreme Court. We've never had such a a political Supreme Court and it's not good for the nation. It hasn't always been this way. And I think that uh, with Lincoln, he was talking specifically about the Dred Scott versus Sanford decision that they made, which went on to say that Americans of African descent, whether free or slave, were not Americans and couldn't sue in federal court. That's what that decision was about, and that's what he was referring to. But folks, I mean, we have to keep pushing back against a political Supreme Court. And John Roberts himself, folks, should be pushing back against a political Supreme Court, but he doesn't seem to be doing that, folks. So going on from there, folks, we had the Michael Cohen trial. Uh, They started to get into a little bit of nuance today, 
and I want you to hear that it was something about a one and a half minute phone call that was made that the uh, defense brought up with Michael Cohen and here's how that went folks uh, Willie so uh, we're looking now just at what happened yesterday and another day of cross-examination of Michael Cohen yesterday. He testified he spoke directly to former President Trump on the phone about the payments to Stormy Daniels. Cohen asserted he contacted Trump through Trump's bodyguard, Keith Schiller, on October 24th, 2016, mm. about the hush money payments. It's about two weeks before Election Day. Defense attorney Todd Blanche pressed Cohen about phone records showing he texted Schiller that day, in which Cohen asked how to handle a teenager who was prank calling him. Cohen responded saying he did not remember that message. Blanche said, quote, do you recall texting Keith Schiller at 7.48 p.m.? Who can I speak to regarding harassing calls to myself in office? The dope forgot to block his call on one of them. You don't recall that? Cohen responded, it sounds right, yes. Blanche then noted a return text to Cohen where Schiller simply says, call me. Blanche then pointed out Cohen called Schiller immediately after for a conversation that lasted only about a minute and a half. Blanche accused Cohen of lying, suggesting he did not speak to Trump during that call about Stormy Daniels as he had testified. Cohen, however, insisted both topics were covered despite the short length of the call. The defense also attempted to paint Cohen as having a vendetta against Trump. Here's a portion of his podcast that was played in court. I truly and hope that this man ends up in prison. It won't bring back the year that I lost or the damage done to my family, but revenge is a dish best served cold. And you better believe I want this man to go down and rot inside for what he did to me and my family. And so folks, you know, Michael Cohen has got every reason to be upset with, with Donald Trump. Donald Trump so far has been just scot-free of any accountability, really. I mean, any accountability. And Michael Cohen, by the way, he spent 13 and a half months in prison in a year and a half in home confinement. The man's pissed. I mean, who wouldn't be? Who wouldn't be, for God's sakes? And that for the defense to actually bring up this phone call and say, you didn't talk about this in that phone call, did you? And try to insinuate that in a conversation that they weren't party of, that's not recorded, that something was said or was not said, basis what? I mean, I, I don't think the jury's uh, going to look at this and, and believe what the defense is trying to say, that you didn't talk about the hush money uh, in that one and a half minute phone call. And they're trying to make it, and, and this is what lawyers do, you know, God bless them. They were trying to make it seem like the prosecution created these memories of what, what, what happened on that phone call in Cohen's mind. Can you believe that? They, you know, the prosecution invented this in Cohen's mind and that they were trying to argue that what Cohen was thinking wasn't organic. <laughs> God, I mean, that's, that's pretty sad stuff, folks. So the other thing that was on the New York Times this morning is Xi Jinping met with Putin um, and... It's kind of funny that uh, Morning Joe kind of compared this to the fact that if Xi Jinping had actually met with Gavin Newsom of California, he would have been meeting with someone who actually had more GDP than Russia. But in any event, uh, those two are getting together. And folks, it just underscores the fact that as that alliance draws closer, you know, flip over what you're buying and look at it. I mean, Made in China uh, is starting to take on a whole different meaning here with this kind of stuff going on. It really is by American, if I can stress that, folks. So two things that they brought up here that are interesting. There's the demographic demographics of both China and Russia. So those two things, they're, they're facing demographic time bombs. China's population is decreasing. Russia's population is decreasing. So the need to form an alliance, folks, uh, is just coming out of necessity for them. And here's some other uh, input, fo too, folks. The, the point that Richard Haas is making on Morning Joe was that, you know, listen, China's not seeing any sort of uh, friendliness, no matter who's president in the United States. You've got Trump, 
you know, you've got Biden, um, both not real friendly to China. So what do they have to lose? Listen to this. It went like this on Morning Joe demographics in Russia. I think the demographics in, in China are even more stark. You're talking about a country of 1.3, 1.4 billion. By the end of the century, we're probably looking at a country with 800 million. Think about the difference. Uh, and, and, and by the way, well, uh, Matt, Matt, you brought it up about Russia. Dead right. I'm so glad you brought up China, too. I've talked to one CEO after another who has told me China's a wreck. In every way, their security forces, the oppression, she, what he's done over the past five years to some of the brightest minds, but they always bring up the demographic time bomb there too. And they say 20, 30 years from now, they're going to be haunted by this one-child policy. That also people are voting with their feet in China too. If yeah. you're a young person who's entrepreneurial, there's no place to, to go. The only danger of this, and there's a big debate going on amongst foreign policy types, does this lead China? to become more assertive or even aggressive. If you have a leadership that can't scratch the ish, itch of nationalism, that it, by, by high levels of economic growth, does China ultimately look at Taiwan as their salvation? And it's interesting. Very good point, folks. You know, are they conflicted enough with these demographic time bombs to be looking at Taiwan as a way to rescue their economy? something to think about and then there's this development that was on the new york times front page folks the the chance or not really the chance it, it sounds like it's going to happen that some of the nato countries are going to be sending uh people to help support and train ukrainians um we're inching a little bit closer folks have a listen to this nato front page story of the new york times today uh nato allies are inching closer to sending troops into Ukraine to train Ukrainian forces. We know how much President Biden has prized revitalizing the NATO alliance. Its 75th summit will be this summer held in Washington. But take us to this decision. There, There's real risk here, too. Well, it wouldn't be combat troops. We're probably talking about trainers. Right now, the training of Ukraine has taken place in places like Poland, and the idea is just to step it up and to have more people on scene and probably give them a little bit more tactical advice. And I think it's a reflection that the, the trajectory of the war is moving against Ukraine. What we've seen in the last few months, in part because of the delay in U.S. military aid for several months, and then also because Russia's really geared up, uh, in part because of Chinese help, North Korean, Iranian help, and their own wartime economy, the, the, battle, the tide of the battle's turning against Ukraine. Not decisively, but the trend is, is clear. And I think what you're beginning to see is are people in NATO saying, what can we do to stem this momentum? And you know, and folks, I've said this before, just in closing here, that when it comes to Ukraine, the situation that we have right now is untenable. And we can't allow this to continue. I think this is the first of many small steps that ultimately it's going to be up to NATO to secure the airspace and to stabilize Ukraine so that they can rebuild. And and I really don't know when that's going to happen, but it should happen sooner rather than later. And of course, it should happen uh in concert with Russia, whatever that means. Folks, I want to thank you for joining me. We'll look for you next time. Till then.